Uh, thank you very much, Benjamin. So, uh, hello and welcome to anyone joining us, and thanks for sticking around if you did. <laughs> uh, so, to finish up the session today, uh, I'm going to conclude with some of the analysis that we believe can be very beneficial for the broad supply system for fleet sustainment. Uh, first, I'm going to talk. Uh, well, we're calling this taming the beast. Uh, you know, uh, making questions about the supply system tractable by quantifying risk. It's going to be broken up into two parts. Uh, so. First, I'm going to talk about uh, overstock analysis, and then my colleague, uh, Dr. Kyle Rimley, will be talking about criticality. So by now, hopefully, we've showed that the readiness team brings a lot to the table. We have a steady and robust pipeline from data gathering and product creation. You've seen that we have a lot of general analysis and methods for gathering all the varied sources of data into something useful, and how we use that for modeling and simulations to pinpoint specific problems and solutions in the sustainment system. But what we want to talk about now is stepping back and looking at the system as a whole. So we have what we're calling these cross-cutting data analysis techniques. Uh, they're conceptually simpler than the much more detailed simulations that we've been talking about. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're any more or any less powerful in their application. Uh, sort of rudimentary pen and paper logic that we're hoping can assist in DoD operations. As I said, uh, I'm going to start this with identifying overstocked and un understocked items in the entire fleet supply system. So. I need to set the stage. The DOD has access to a pool of money that they call the Working Capital Fund. This is a pool of money that's always available as it's not subject to annual approval by Congress. And this is important because it allows the organization to maintain a stability year-round in the sustainment hierarchy. But this also creates a problem, uh, as you might have seen from our previous talks. They need to buy today a multitude of varied items for the next couple of years in order to keep this a healthy supply to uh, maintain readiness. This is currently accomplished with a sophisticated version of guessing which of these items they may or may not need, uh, a lot of which are just badly behaved in a statistical sense. It makes it hard for you to predict outright what you need. And this is to be expected. We're not calling anyone out. This is something that's going to happen in a very complex organization for a very large problem. But we think that using these simple applications, we can help with uh, this. Uh, situation. So, the DOD has billions of dollars that are tied up in overstock items or low demand items. How do we get here? So, you've got your items sitting on your shelf. If something breaks, you need to go and see what you have to go uh, fix whatever is broken. Uh, this can lead to two very uh, extremes in your problems. There's understocking your items, and this is obvious. Anyone could have told you this is going to be a problem. You go look for you know, the part that you need for your plane, it's not there. Obviously, that's going to cause an issue in your readiness. Uh, and this is going to deny a better opportunity for allocating your crucial funds, that pool of money that you need to maintain the uh, hierarchy. But the other one is overstocking the items. Uh, this is an opportunity cost. If you are buying too many of these items, you've used that money that you have a finite supply of that you could have used better for uh, allocating towards those uh, items that would be on the red shelf here. So usually, this is actually a problem that has already fixed itself, but you didn't know that it already fixed itself. You saw that you were running out of it. Maybe that item was looking like the one on the red shelf. And someone in the past said, we should buy more of these. And as we said, to your lead time, it suddenly turns into an overstocking problem. You need someone to actually look at this and see that it has been treated. So they, the DOD has all the data to process this, uh, but they aren't thinking about how to use it in this way. So. As often stated, part of this problem is that it's just stovepiped. Like no one's looking at the whole picture. And if there is optimization, it's happening on a specific level, but not for the entire uh, broad system. So there's a gap in the uh, organizational knowledge. There's a blind spot, but we're hoping that we can do some of the load balancing to help fix this. So we've come up with a rather simple metric, as you can see. We're calling a lead times of stock. Uh, we might need a different nomenclature for this because every time we say lead times of stock, people think we're talking about lead times, which goes into the <laughs> lead times of stock, but we made these slides a while ago, so bear with me. Uh, so we need a consistent way to compare the posture of these different items within uh, the entire infrastructure that the DOD manages, uh, and this is the metric that we use. So let's go through the simple examples that will lead to the two extremes that I've been talking about. You got your flux capacitors. You got 10 of them sitting on the shelf, right? And they have a very low demand rate. They, they don't burn through that fast. And, you know, they actually come in 
on a rather uh, decent amount of time every two weeks or so. So you can imagine that this is going to lead to your high lead time stock. You're going to build this up. It's, it's a very simple sort of uh, analysis that you can see that's going to lead to more and more sitting on the shelf. Your other end is that you got these gonculators. Same number of them, 10, but when you look at the you know, large demand in the long restock time, suddenly this metric that we're using is going to say, oh, we're hitting into that red. We're running out of these fast, and you need to you know, ramp up the, uh, ramp up the uh, procurements. Otherwise, you're going to run out of these things. So if you don't do any intervention and you don't, you don't do this sort of uh, basic analysis to see which end of this uh, you're, you're sitting in with these items, you get a very ugly picture for your entire stock. Uh, and well, let's just think about what you think the stock should look like. Right? Okay, these are the extremes, but you say, roughly speaking, these are edge cases, right? We would hope that everything's sitting in that rather nice, healthy area. And I'm priming you very specifically for the picture that I, we did come up with for the DOD stock posture. I want you to dwell on this because this is not good, right? Well, when we showed this to our DOD partners, they were actually shocked. They did not realize how much of this was sitting in the, in the lower stock or how much is dwindling off. So right here is, is a product that we came up with, with, as I said, pen and paper sort of math. Uh, and so how we broke, the, we, we broke this up. Yes, you got your uh, lead times of stock, which is how we're doing this metric uh, that demarcates the different areas. If it's anywhere underneath half a lead time of stock, those are the ones that are you know, critical. Those are the ones that you are understocked on and you need to get those on, on the shelf. So obviously you're going to invest in that. You got some in between the half to full lead time of stock that we're calling at risk. You should keep an eye on those and you, you build your way up to this. Healthy, we're calling anything between one full lead time of stock and two lead, full lead times of stock. But anything out over that, that's the overstocked picture. That's, that's stuff that you could have used that money to help in that red section. So we're actually going to focus on that. That's going to be our primary concern. And how do we know that we're right in this? How do we know that this picture is going to, you know, be a somewhat consistent way of looking at this as we go through the data? We need to validate this diagnosis, right? So let's go and validate this. Uh, we can, we have access to the data uh, over a long enough timeline that we can use these predictions at a previous date to see if this method of saying, well, these would have stayed on the shelf, they were fine, is actually true. So what do we do? Go back in time two years. Say, quarter of uh, FY19, first quarter of FY19, what did that picture look like? What, get this picture of, of the entire stock and say, okay, from there, apply some rather basic logic just to weed out any uh, items that you'd be like, well, it's got an open repair, so that would push it out of the overstocks. Okay, maybe you don't need to consider that one, but you only consider the ones that you know would still stay inside of this picture if you didn't do anything, like just based off of the knowledge that you had at that day. You say, okay, from those items, move forward the clock. If we're right, this should mostly look the same, right? We're, we're, we're telling you these items are going to stay on the shelf. And when we validate this, we move forward to the uh, two years in the future, and we see that the majority of these items were still overstocked. They were still sitting on that shelf. You could have invested that, uh, any money that you put into it onto something else. Now, the numbers we get out of this, 3% you know, of these are select items that actually moved either you know, to the at risk or to the, the critical part of that graph. And we realized that, of course, I mean, this was a basic analysis. So you would take that, and hopefully uh, SME would come in and say, wait, wait, wait. This is a badly behaved part. We know that it's going to break because of X, Y, or Z. And they would have pulled those 3% out. But for the majority of these items, they, they would still be sitting there. They would still be just collecting dust on the shelf. And what this accounts for is, you know, we, if you spent $100 million on creating that picture, on, on all the items in, inside the yellow square here, you know, 90 2% of that, $92 million, you could have invested in those red parts. You could have gotten the critical things that would have made more craft mission capable. Right. So this is, we're hoping, again, very simple, but eye-opening and powerful and something that you can just bring to someone who is working inside of some level of the sustainment structure to say, 
wait a second, maybe we shouldn't sign off on every single contract we have coming through. So, simple summary is, you know, we have developed this analytically powerful tool that I've been stressing it because I'm assuming everyone in the audience is also saying, well, duh, and duh is correct, but we had to do it, right? It was, it was obvious and someone had to look at this. So we did so you don't have to, and now you can. Uh, the other important part is that this is determining actual improvements in the spending picture. Eye-opening and shocking for our partners, and I'm assuming if you did this analysis at whatever level that you're working at, it would also reveal something about the stock posture picture that would open up questions that you could look into. And you know, finally, and we will always stress this, especially on the team, this is a decision aid. This is not the end-all be-all. You hand this off to someone or you consult with a subject matter expert who knows those parts in and out and can tell you, wait a second, you, this said that you don't need any more of these. I know something that the data doesn't know. And then you, you factor that in. So it, it, it's not a, a fire and forget. It's a, okay, how does this uh, augment our decision-making process? Now there's a big caveat to this though. This is a completely financial picture. It has you know, no preference for a nuclear reactor or some toilet paper, right? It, it treated every part the same and it only looked at their lead times and I mean, the financial aspects of it. So for that you need an extra uh, bit to the equation, what we're calling criticality, to gauge how each individual part is gonna impact the readiness of whatever system you're looking at. And for that, I'm gonna to turn to my colleague, Dr. Kyle Rimley, to discuss that aspect. Uh, okay. All right, so picking up where picking up where we left off, uh, and uh, let me let me try to let me try to set the stage here. The the the, the scenario that we're kind of dealing with is that, like, let's say that I am some sort of DOD uh, item manager enterprise. I have 200,000 items to manage, and I have to keep whatever I can in stock to make sure that my warfighters can actually accomplish their missions. Okay, I have 200 items that, that, I, that I manage. I only have money to buy 50,000 of them. So what do I buy? And as my colleague, uh, Dr. Fabridius, talked about, he said, okay, well, as it turns out, we actually already have plenty of, of, of 100,000 of those. So, you know, don't, don't even worry about those. We're, we're, you know, we're good for the foreseeable on those. But that, okay, so we've got 100,000 left, but I still need to buy 50,000, 50, uh, I, I can still only buy 50,000 items. What 50,000 items do I buy? Fortunately here, uh, we note that not all items are created equal. You know, there's, there's, the, there's the nuclear reactor and there's the toilet paper, right? And so, so the, the, the DoD knows this, and the DoD has, these, uh, has uh, uh, some metadata called uh, item, mission, item Mission Essentiality Codes, or IMEX, that sort of give a qualitative measure of an item's importance. A bigger IMEX means it's more important, and a smaller IMEX means it's less important. And so how, how does the DoD, how does the DoD uh, decide these? Well, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, every item has its own story. You know, you know the, 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 late, the latest procurement brings in a new flux capacitor, and the engineer says, you got to have this flux capacitor. It's, it's vital to, to actually get this thing up and running. Uh, but then, on, on the other hand, you also have the, the soldiers and sailors who actually use these systems and say, well, you know, the flux capacitor is important, but really, you know, it's the dilithium crystals. Those are, those are really what we need, you know. And so, and, and, and so, so they, they kind of get a say, and then an IMEC gets, then, then an IMEC gets picked. And then we say, okay, that's, that's this item's IMEC, and then we move on to the next one. Uh, and the, the, problem, the problem with this is that it's sort of a non-standard selection criteria. It's, you know, whoever, you know, whoever says, you know, why, why, is, why is this item important? Well, whoever said, that's, that's why this item is important. And what, what, what's the, what, is the, what is the impact of, 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 of using this selection method? So... It, uh, IMEX typically go on a one to five scale, one being least critical and five being most critical. And, you know, this, the, the, this, this, this selection method, you know, is, is, is perfectly fine, is perfectly acceptable for the well duh cases. You know, you, you need a parachute to be able to fly because otherwise it's not safe to do so. If you don't have a parachute, you're not going on a mission. It's as simple as that. Whereas the cup holder, you, you need it, you don't need it. 
You know, who can, who, you know, who can really say? So you might say, okay, well, well duh. You know, so what, what's the problem here? The problem then lies in sort, of, in sort of the middle ground. You know, you know that the parachute's more important than the cup holder. But what about the radar? How relatively important is the radar? What about the circuit card? You know, is it, you know, what, 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 is, what is it powering? What about the radio? How important is it? And all of a sudden, if I'm an item manager and I can only buy one of a radio, a circuit card, or a radar, and I can't, tr and if I know that these IMAX are kind of just, just so selected, whoever spoke last gets to choose it, I don't necessarily know if I'm going to buy the right item to support the warfighter. So instead, what we really need is a consistent, systematic approach to selecting these IMAX. And so that way everyone understands what an IMAC 4 really means. And so we say, oh, an IMAC 4? Okay, I know that. And I know that an IMAC 4 is more important than an IMAC 3. So there, then I have the confidence to actually buy the radar and not buy the circuit card because I, I, know, I know where that, where that data, where that, where that metadata came from. So, so what, what, are, what are we suggesting then? Well, as, as the name of this conference might suggest, we say, look at the data. Let's have the DOD tell itself what items are important. And we do that by looking at two different aspects of uh, historical item demand data. And we kind of, and, uh, we kind of visualize it on this, on this uh, uh, 2D graph here. And on one axis, we have number of historical demands. And this, this is a relatively simple heuristic. If the DOD is asking for this item, if the, if the warfighter is asking for an item consistently, reliably, repeatedly, then it's more important than the item that it's not asking for consistently. And, you know, you can kind of think about this, you know, uh, yourself with your own grocery shopping. You buy, a, you buy a, a, a gallon of milk every week, and so that's more important, unfortunately, than the chocolate cake that you buy only every six months or so. <laughs> I'm giving everyone credit. Um, and then on the other axis, uh, we have uh, item criticality. And this is really... Um, sort of a, uh, a fraction of how often uh, if you don't have this, if you don't have a functional uh, uh, copy of this item, can you go on your mission? And so, so we say if an item is 0% critical, then it doesn't matter if you have the item or not, you can go do missions. If an item is 100% critical, then if you don't have this item, you can never do missions, and there's nothing you can do about it. And by combining these two aspects of historical demand data, because every, uh, every requisition says, you know, I need, you know, I need this flux capacitor and I can fly my mission, or I need this flux capacitor and I can't fly my mission. Using, using this own historical data, uh, we can put this together and sort of give a, a quantitative measure of an item's importance. And so what we see is that items in the upper right-hand corner, items that the DOD asks for frequently, and items with high item criticality, meaning that uh, if you don't have it, well, again, you can't fly your missions. These are going to be your most important items, by definition. Uh, compare that with items that are either high demand, lower criticality, or lower demand, higher criticality. And they're important, but not necessarily as important as the upper right-hand items. And then finally, you know, you've got your, you've got your, you know, your, your, your cup holders and your ice cream machine, <coughs> ice cream machines on the lower uh, Lower left-hand corner, where uh, where where there aren't too many uh, where there aren't too many demands, and whether or not you have it, you can still fly. So so now we've got you know a, a data-driven approach to item importance. But I said item importance. I didn't say IMAC. I started by talking about IMAX. So how do we relate? How do we how do we go back? Well, IMAC is a qualitative me uh, IMAC is a qualitative measure. It's you know, th you know, three is more important than two, five is more important than four, but how importance itself maps to IMAC is inherently subjective. But because you have this historical data, we can go to our DOD partners and say, okay, how important do you want to define an IMAC 2? How important do you want to define an IMAC 5? And so one partner might say, I want the breakdown to look like this. Another partner might say, I want it to look like this. Or people who like fun might want, uh, might want to break down to look like this. 
But the point is, is that this is an agreed upon standard that going into it, when we, when we evaluate what item is more important, what, what's an IMAC 4 and what's an IMAC 3, we understand what, what, we're, what we're all talking about. It's not subjective, we're leveling the playing field. So, so let's, bring in, let's bring in some, some, some real or, or real-ish data here. So we looked at uh, uh, you know, a few, uh, uh, some, some DOD managed items sort of you know, anonymized the data. And we found you know, that the uh, legacy IMAX that they had, you know, this, you know, this one's an IMAX 4, this one's an IMAX 2, and so on. Uh, we plotted it against the, the demands on the x-axis and the item criticality on the y-axis. So you can kind of think of this plot as just a, a realistic version of the plots that I showed on the last couple of slides. And we found that, you know, not surprisingly, the, the legacy IMAX don't necessarily correlate well with our defined importance of item metric, item uh, importance. Now, this isn't, this isn't a, an attack or anything. They weren't designed to. You know, so, so you know, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't necessarily expect that. But then you contrast that with, uh, with, with uh, the, the IDA approach for uh, generating IMAX. And what we see is a much more systematic uh, uh, approach to selecting these IMAX. And you, and you see, you know, in general, as importance increases, you're going to see an increase in, in IMAX as well. Um, but, but great, you know, so far all we've said is, you know, we, we, came up, we came up with a new rubric and our, and, you know, surprise, our rubric correlates more. You know, big whoop. What, is, what, is, what does that mean? And so we can, what we can do is we can actually look at uh, the items, roll them up and say, okay, you know, by IMAC, how many, how many items do I have that are, you know, IMAC 4? How many items do I have that are IMAC 1? And what we find... Uh, uh, interestingly, here is that the uh, the legacy approach to, to to choosing IMAX tends to be more conservative. You've got a lot more IMAX fours and fives because you know it, because of the subject because of the subjectivity. You know, an engineer said this flux capacitor is important. The sailor said this, these dilithium crystals are absolutely necessary. But when actually looking at the the actual historical demand data, we see that you can actually get away with being a little less uh, a little less uh, uh, conservative, and this this has a couple of knock on effects. Number one is if you say that more things are important, then you're going to incentivize purchasing more things. And if all of a sudden people are going to buy pur purchase more things, you're going to lean uh, you're going to get yourself leaning back more towards uh, the overstock uh, uh, posture that my colleague Dr. Fabridi has talked about. Um, another issue is that if everything's important, then nothing is. Right. If too many things are IMAC fours and fives, then I can't. Then I, as an item manager, can't really decide. Okay, I know that I need to go buy this. But by actually using this data-driven approach and erring less conservative, I say, okay, I can afford one more item. I see one IMAC five. Well, I know what I'm buying. So, putting it all together, uh, and and this this uh, in, you know, and and. I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of call back, and this, this, isn't, this isn't exactly fair, but uh, my, my, my colleague, Dr. Ashwell, who's chairing the session, uh, uh, brought this up at his talk as well. Uh, the, 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 val the value that, the, that these analyses really bring is that we're actually able to bring all of the DOD's own data and put it together in one place where people can actually make a decision. We can actually take, you know, this, ready, this readiness-based data to say, you know, this item is more important than, for readiness than this item. You know, and we can take our, our stocking posture. You have this much of this item, and you have this much of this item, and you're going to run out in three years, six months, two days, whatever. And we can actually put all of it together in a single place and say, okay, the parachute's more important than the circuit card. The circuit card's more important than the cup holder. And as it happens, you, have, you, you already have enough of the radio and the radar. You don't, you don't need to buy any. And by actually putting all of the data in one place, now all of a sudden, you know, the, the, we, can, we can actually let the data tell us what it, what it is meant to tell us. And we can actually make uh, uh, good decisions for both the long-term solvency of our item manager enterprise, as well as the long-term readiness of the warfighter. So uh, that's kind of my get off the stage. I'll, I'll be ready to take, uh, um, I myself or Dr. Fabridius will be ready to take questions and then we can uh, wrap up. Hi, uh, thank you. I'm uh, Major Deaver with Half Attack. Um, I have a little bit of an issue with using uh, the demand 
um, because I guess from my perspective, if you have a high demand for something that could potentially lead or uh, point to other issues such as high break items that um, shouldn't break as much. So I'm curious uh, how, uh, if you correlate this beyond just simply overstock, but to potentially pointing to other uh, issues. Sure. If I could, if I could also tie this back into our our, our simulation capability, uh, like do, in your example, you know, like things that are breaking that shouldn't be breaking, you know, we would we would input, you know, the, these the, we would use these uh, demand data to inform the failure rates that we would use as inputs for those simulations, and then the simulation would say, well, you're heavily backordered on the on the ice cream machine at the flux capacitor, and then the system expert can say, wait, why are we so backordered here? This sh you know, this shouldn't be failing, and then so so. Uh, and so, so then you can go and make uh, make informed decisions there. So, so you know, maybe you know, maybe not from these uh, from the the supply uh, uh, aspect of our of our analyses, but certainly the the end to end sustainment uh, can can certainly uh, sort of uh, inform where your head herders are in that in that regard. Okay. Yeah, I I just kind of see that as the next logical step because if you have like a bolt that is you know breaking every three missions when it's supposed to be lasting ten missions, you're you're sustaining that by buying it. But there's a further issue that it it could be um, uncovered by this kind of analysis. Absolutely, absolutely. One 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 thing that I that I would say is that uh, a lot of the end to end sustainment. It you know it there's there's a lot of talk about like spares and buying spares, but it gets you beyond that as well. You know it could, it gets you to other improvement initiatives such as you know actually reducing the darn failure rates of these things. So. Sorry, that's loud. Parker King, uh, I also work at Alphatech. Uh, this is a question for the whole team. A uh, major underlying kind of assumption with all of this is that all of the historical metadata is there, right? Or most of it is there. Uh, and so how, well, are you, are you assuming that it's all there or have you ensured that it's all there? How are you accounting for that? Um. There's 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 a, there's a lot of there's a lot of baked in assumptions. I think uh, my, my my colleague uh, uh, Dr. Gelsinger in particular talked a lot about um, this uh, software tool we use called Honeybee, and there's um, uh, myriad business logic decisions that are baked in there about what happens when you don't have data. What assumptions do you make? Uh, and you know per perhaps you know I, you know uh, you know some, some, somebody else can kind of uh, jump in, but we. Not deal, dealing with absent or incomplete or missing data or censored data are things that we know that we have to deal with, and that's most of the job, as as it as it turns out. And so we, you know, we, you know, I mean, we, you know, we can talk about, I guess, specific examples, uh, you know, if, if you know, depending on what the specific question is. But we 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 are aware of that, and there's a lot of the underlying code goes into actually fixing those issues. Just, 
um, a couple more things to say there um, is that the way that the data looks and the information that's available is also um, something that varies by the services. So when I was talking about the different tools that we have, um, that is the reason why some of the, the different tools for the different services exist um, is that the information that's recorded for um, in the maritime world is different than what's recorded in the naval aviation world. Um, and so that, that's part of why these different tools exist is because just the information that's collected and the way that it's collected is different for, for different groups. Um, I'd also say that something that's uh, new and an exciting line of work for us going into the future is how do we now not only legacy systems, systems that exist, but now how do we try to use these tools to help um, platforms that are trying to be stood up? And that's something that's really exciting and that gets to uh, the, the heart of working with data that doesn't exist, right? <laughs> these platforms don't have operational, they don't have historical data on operations uh, and on demands. They're trying to forecast what items they think are going to be a part of the platform, what they think they're going to fly, what they, um, you know, where they think they're going to be located. Um, and so that's an additional, uh, um, it's additional amount of work uh, and uncertainty in that, but luckily we have so much flexibility in these tools that we can play around with. Can, can you give me a range <laughs> of hours that you think you're going to fly? Um, and, and there's a lot of flexibility in, in the type of operations um, and, the, and the supply systems um, and, and, how we, um, and, and how we structure that. Um, but talking with SMEs is, um, I, I think, uh, a, a Super, super important if that hasn't come across. I know there's a lot of discussion on uh, ML and AI and a lot of techniques that are trying to make things easier, but I think something that we really focus on our group is the importance of we have these tools. It definitely lowers the barrier for entry, but they're, I wouldn't say they're useless without SMEs, but the, the humans are super important um, in understanding the data that we have and the limitations. Sweet, thanks. I just wanted to say this was a really cool presentation, so thanks. Thank you. Oops. Uh, hi, my name is Tina Ellie. I'm with CAPE. I think I know most of the presenters. Um, awesome briefs. So I have a question, and the first one is a more of a generalized question on the analysis, and the other one is a bit more contextual. So the first one had to do with the stock supply. Was it a generalized assessment and inventory of all stocks or uh, also taking uh, account of the local, different local demands and changes in local demands? In, in what you saw, specifically, yeah. it was all ready for issue stock um, at wholesale sites, excluding at retail sites because of policy that made no sense. But uh, you could split the switch and say, well, no, no. I want all the stock, and it changes the graph a little bit. Um, the second one, uh, my second question is, assuming we're not talking about things that are trivial like cup holders, but other um, more relevant to the war fight, um, is there any analysis of something that now is way out, um, overstock that we don't necessarily um, need a lot of? or have too much of, at which point was that particular thing at risk? Because was it, we were flying in a place that had a lot of sand, and we were always backordered on it, and then we bought a bunch of it because we were in the place with a lot of sand for 10 years. Now we're no longer flying in the place with a lot of sand. It's gone down, we're overstocked, but it's important to know if we were to go back with a place and a lot of sand, that thing might come back up again. And the, the, the point in the, the, the overstock in the yellow or the gold, yeah. the point is not to put diggers. This is yeah, yeah, I get you can it. if you want to, but it's really to say, stop buying more. Yeah. Because what we'll see is that the whole point of this talk was there's stuff in the yellow where the DOD is buying billions of dollars more. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, there are good reasons. Mm -hmm. But using the time machine validation approach, we went back in time to 2019 said, well, using the gonculator, what shouldn't you have bought? 97% of the time, the gonculator was right. That if you hadn't bought it, you had they were planning to buy more, and they hadn't bought more, they would have still been overstocked today. Okay. So you're right, there are special, there are a lot of cases, but there's also just stuff where 
knee-jerk reaction, too yeah. quick, sweep up $100 million, uh, buy more of this, this, and this. The admiral loves that one, buy that. Yeah, I was just curious if there was a survey of those things were at some point at risk. They are all yellow now, but we can track that. Some of the yellow resulted from, at some point, them being at risk and trying to understand the context of that at-risk point. That's we have not done that specific study. It would be very interesting to see if some of the current overstock yeah. items have had their demand rate drop dramatically in the last four or five years. Or in places where we were active in certain areas and where we're less now. <laughs>